but he is of one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desires, even that he does. Job 23, verse 13. It is very advantageous to the Christian mind frequently to consider the deep and unsearchable attributes of God. The beneficial effect is palpable in two ways, exerting a sacred influence both on the judgment and the heart. In respect to the one, it tends to confirm us in those good old orthodox doctrines which lie as the basis of our faith. If we study man and make him the only object of our research, there will be a strong tendency in our minds to exaggerate his importance. We shall think too much of the creature and too little of the creator, preferring that knowledge which is to be found out by observation and reason to that divine truth which revelation alone can make known to us. The basis and groundwork of Arminian theology lies in attaching undue importance to man and giving God rather the second place than the first. Let your mind dwell for a long time upon man as a free agent, upon man as a responsible being, upon man not so much as being under God's claims as having claims upon God, and you will soon find upspringing in your thoughts a set of crude doctrines to support which the letter of some few isolated texts in the scripture may be specially quoted but which really in spirit are contrary to the whole tenor of the word of God. Thus, your orthodoxy will be shaken to its very foundation, and your soul will be driven out to sea again without peace or joy. Brethren, I am not afraid that any man who thinks worthily about the Creator stands in awe of his adorable perfection, and sees him sitting upon the throne, doing all things according to the counsel of his will could go far wrong in his doctrinal sentiments. He may say, My heart is fixed, O God. And when the heart is fixed, with a firm conviction of the greatness, the omnipotence, the divinity indeed of him whom we call God, the head will not wander far from truth. Another happy result of such meditation is the steady peace, the grateful calm it gives to the soul. Have you been a long time at sea? And has a continual motion of the ship sickened and disturbed you? Have you come to look upon everything as moving till you scarcely put one foot before the other without the fear of falling down because the floor rocks beneath your tread? With what delight do you put your feet at last upon the shore and say, Ah, this does not move. This is solid ground. Though the tempest howl, this island is safely moored. She will not start from her bearings. When I tread on her, she will not yield beneath my feet. Just so it is with us when we turn from the ever-shifting, often boisterous tide of earthly things to take refuge in the eternal God, who has been our dwelling place in all generations. The fleeting things of human life and the fickle thoughts and showy deeds of men are so movable and changeable as the waters of the treacherous deep. But when we mount up, as it were, with eagle's wings to him that sits upon the circle of the earth, before whom all its inhabitants are as grasshoppers, we nestle in the rock of ages, which from its eternal socket never starts, and in its fixed immovability never can be disturbed. Or to use another simile, you have seen little children running round and round and round, till they get giddy and they stand still and hold fast a moment, and everything seems to be flying round about them, but holding fast and still, and getting into the mind the fact that that to which they hold at least is firm, at last the brain grows still again, and the world ceases to whirl. So you and I have been these six days like little children running around in circles, and everything has been moving with us, till perhaps as we came into this place this morning, we felt as if the promises of God had moved, as if providence had shifted, our friends had died, our kindred passed away, and we came to look on everything as a floating mass, nothing firm, nothing fixed. Brethren, let us get a good grip today of the immutability of God. Let us stand still a while and know that the Lord is God. We shall see at length the things that we shall see at length that things that do not move as we dreamed they did. 
To everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under the heaven. There is a still, fixedness, in that which seems most fickle. That which appears to be most dreamy has a reality, inasmuch as it is part of that divinely substantial scheme which God is working out. The end whereof shall be his eternal glory. Twill cool your brain. Twill calm your heart, my brother. Twill make you go back to the world's fight, quiet and composed. It'll make you stand fast in the day of temptation. If now, through divine grace, you can come near to God and offer the tribute of your devotion, who is without variableness or shadow of turning. The text will be considered by us this morning, first, as enunciating a general truth, and secondly, out of that general truth we shall fetch another, upon which we will enlarge, I trust, to comfort us. The text may be regarded as teaching a general truth. We will take the first clause of the sentence, he is in one mind. Now the fact taught here is that in all the acts of God and providence, he has a fixed and settled purpose. He is in one mind. It is eminently consolatory to us, who are God's creatures, to know that he did not make us without a purpose, and that now in all his dealings with us, he has the same wise and gracious end to be served. We suffer the headaches. The heart leaps with palpitation. The blood creeps sluggishly along, where its healthy flow should have been more rapid. We lose our limbs, or crushed by an accident. Some sense fails us. The eye is eclipsed in perpetual night. Our mind is racked and disturbed. Our fortunes vary. Our goods disappear before our eyes. Our children Portions of ourselves sicken and die. Our crosses are as continual as our lives. We are seldom long at ease. We are born to sorrow, and certainly it is an inheritance of which we are never deprived. We suffer continually. Will it not reconcile us to our sorrows, that they serve some end? To be scourged needlessly, we consider it to be a disgrace. But to be scourged... If our country were to be served, we should consider it an honor because there is a purpose in it. To suffer the maiming of our bodies because of some whim of a tyrant would be a hard thing to bear. But if we minister by it to the will of our families or to the glory of our God, we would be content not to be mutilated once, but to be cut piecemeal away, that so his great purpose might be answered. O oh, believer, ever look on your sufferings as being parts of the divine plan, and say as wave upon wave rolls over you, he is in one mind. He is carrying out still his one great purpose. None of these comes by chance. None of these happens to me out of order. But everything comes to me according to the purpose of his own will, and answers to the purpose of his own great mind. We have to labor. How hard do some men labor who have to toil for their daily bread? Their bread is saturated with their sweat. They wear no garment which they have not woven out of their own nerves and muscles. How sternly as well do others labor who have with their brain to serve their fellow men or their God? How have some heroic missionaries spent themselves and been spent in their fond enterprise? How have many ministers of Christ exhausted not simply the body but the mind? Their hilarity, so natural to them, has given place to despondency, and the natural effervescence of their spirits has at last died out into loneliness of soul through the desperateness of their ardor. Sometimes this labor for God is unrequited. We plow, but the furrow yields no harvest. We sow, but the field refuses the grain, and the devouring bellies of the hungry birds alone are satisfied with it. We build, but the storm cast down the stones which we had quarried, with Herculean efforts piled one on another. We sweat, we toil, we fail. How often we come back weeping because we have toiled, as we think, without success. Yet. Christian man, 
you have not been without success, for he is still in one mind. All this is necessary to the fulfillment of his one purpose. You are not lost. Your labor has not rotted under the clods. All, though you don't see it, has been working together towards a desired end. Stand upon the sea beach for a moment. A wave has just come up, preening in its pride. Its crown of froth is spent. As it leaps beyond its fellow, it dies. It dies. And now another. And it dies. And now another. And it dies. O oh, weep not, deep sea, be not sorrowful. For though each wave dies, yet you prevail. O oh, thou mighty ocean, onward does a flood advance, till it has covered all the sand and washed the feet of the white cliffs. So it is with God's purpose. You and I are only waves of his great sea. We wash up. We seem to retire, as if there had been no advance. Another wave comes. Still each wave must retire, as if there had been no advance. Another wave comes. Still each wave must retire, as if there had been no progress. But the great divine sea of his purpose is still moving on. He is still of one mind and carrying out his plan. How sorrowful it often seems to think how good men die. They learn through the days of their youth, and often before they come to years, to use their learning they are gone. The blade is made and annealed in many a fire, but ere the foreman uses it, it snaps. How many laborers, too, in the master's vineyard, who when by their experience they were getting more useful than ever, have been taken away just when the church wants them most. He that stood upright in the chariot, guiding the steeds, suddenly falls back and we cry, My father, my father, the horsemen of Israel, and the chariot of it. Still, notwithstanding all, we may console ourselves in the midst of our grief with the blessed reflection that everything is part of God's plan. He is still of one mind. Nothing happens which is not part of the divine scheme. To enlarge our thoughts a moment, have you ever noticed in reading history how nations suddenly decay when their civilization has advanced so far that we ought it would produce men of the highest mold? Suddenly old age begins to wrinkle its brow, its arms grow weak, the scepter falls, and the crown drops from the head. And we have said, is not the world gone back again? The barbarian has sacked the city, and where once everything was beauty, now there is nothing but ruthless bloodshed and destruction. Ah, but my brethren, although things were but the carrying out of the divine plan, just so you may have seen sometimes upon the hard rock the lichen spring. Soon as the lichen race grows grand, it dies. But why? It is because his death prepares the moss, and the moss, which is feeble compared with the lichen, grows, at last increases till you see before you the finest specimens of that genus, but the moss decays. Yet weep not for its decaying, its ashes shall prepare a soul for some plants of a little higher growth. And as these decay one after another, Race after race, they at last prepared the soul upon which even the goodly cedar itself might stretch out its roots. So has it been with the race of men. Egypt, in Assyria, Babylon, Greece, and Rome have crumbled each and all when their hour had come to be succeeded by a better. And if this race of ours should ever be eclipsed, if the Anglo Saxons' boasted pride should yet be stained, even then it will prove to be a link in the divine purpose. Still in the end, his one mind shall be carried out. His one great result shall by it be achieved. Not only the decay of nations, but the apparent degeneration of some races of men, and even the total extinction of others forms a part of the like fixed purpose. In all those cases, there may be reasons of sorrow, but faith sees grounds of rejoicing. 
to gather up all in one the calamities of the earthquake, the devastations of storm, the extirpations of war, and all the terrible catastrophes of plague have only been co-workers with God, slaves compelled to tug the galley of the divine purpose across the sea of time. From every evil good has come, and the more the evil has accumulated, the more has God glorified himself in bringing out at last his grand and everlasting design. This, I take, is the first general lesson of the text. In every event of providence, God has a purpose. He is in one mind. Mark, not only a purpose, but only one purpose. For all history is but one. There are many scenes, but it is one drama. There are many pages, but it is one book. There are many leaves, but it is one tree. There are many provinces, yea, and by it lords many and rulers many. Yet is there but one empire, and God the only potentate. O come, let us worship and bow down before him. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Number two. Who can turn him? This is the second clause of the sentence. And here I think we are taught the doctrine that the purpose of God is unchanged. The first sentence shows that he is the purpose. The second shows that it is incapable of change. Who can turn him? There are some shallow thinkers who dream that the great plan, the design of God, was thrown out of order by the fall of man. The fall they consider as being an accidental circumstance, not intended in the divine plan. And so God being placed in a delicate predicament of requiring to sacrifice his justice or his mercy, use the plan of the atonement of Christ as the divine expedient. Brethren, it may be lawful to use such terms. It may be lawful to you. It would not be to me. For well I am persuaded that the very fall of man was a part of the divine purpose. That even the sin of Adam though he did it freely, was nevertheless contemplated in the divine scheme. And it has by no means such a thing as to involve a digression from its primary plan. Then came the deluge, and the race of man was swept away, but God's purpose was not affected by the destruction of the race. In after years his people Israel forsook him and worshipped Baal and Ashtoreth, but his purpose was not changed any more by the defection of his chosen nation than by the destruction of his creatures. And when in after years the gospel was sent to the Jews and they resisted it, and Paul and Peter turned to the Gentiles, do not suppose that God had to take down his books and make an erasure or an amendment. No, the whole was written there from the beginning. He knew everything of it. He has never altered a single sentence nor changed a single line of the divine purpose. What he intended the great picture to be, that it shall be at the end, and where you shall see some black strokes which seem not in keeping these, shall yet be toned down, and where there are some brighter dashes too bright for the somber picture, these shall yet be brought into harmony. And when in the end God shall exhibit the whole, he shall elicit both from men and angels tremendous shouts of praise, while they say, Great and marvelous are your work, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, you King of saints, for you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. Where we have thought his government was wrong, there shall it prove most right. And where we dreamed he had forgotten to be good, there shall his goodness be most clear. It is a sweet consolation to the mind of one who muses much upon these deep manners, that God never has changed in any degree from his purpose, and the result will be notwithstanding everything to the contrary, just precisely in every jot and tittle what he foreknew and foreordained it should be. Now wars may rise, and other Alexanders and Caesars may spring up, but he will not change. Now nations and peoples, lift up yourselves and let your parliaments pass your decrees, but God changes not. Now rebels foam at the mouth, well let your fury boil, but he doesn't change for you. 
O nations and peoples and tongues, and you round earth, you speed on your orbit still, and all the fury of your inhabitants cannot make you move from your predestinated pathway. Creation is an arrow from the bow of God, and that arrow goes on, straight on, without deviation, to the center of that target which God ordained that it should strike. Never varied in his plan, he is without variableness or shadow of turning. Albert Barnes very justly says, It is, when properly understood, a manner of unspeakable consolation that God has a plan. For who could honor a God who had no plan? but who did everything by haphazard. It is a manner of rejoicing that he has one great purpose which extends through all ages and embraces all things, for then everything falls into its proper place and has its appropriate bearing on other events. It is a manner of joy that God does execute all his purposes, for as they were all good and wise, it is desirable that they should be executed. It would be a calamity if a good plan were not executed. Why then should men murmur at the purposes or the decrees of God? Number three, the text also teaches a third general truth. Well, God has a purpose, and that purpose has never changed. The third clause teaches us that this purpose is sure to be effected. What a soul desires, even that he does. He made the world out of nothing. There was no resistance there. Light be, he said, and light was. There was no resistance there. Providence be, he said, and providence shall be. And when you shall come to see the end as well as the beginning, you shall find that there was no resistance there. It is a wonderful thing how God effects his purpose while still the creature is free. They who think that predestination and the fulfillment of the divine purpose is contrary to the free agency of man know not what they say, nor whereof they affirm. It was no miracle for God to effect his own purpose if he were dealing with rocks and stones, with granite and with trees. But this is a miracle of miracles that the creatures are free, absolutely free, and yet the divine purpose stands. Herein is wisdom. This is a deep, unsearchable truth. Man walks without a fetter, yet treads in the very steps which God ordained him to tread in. It certainly is though miracles had bound him to the spot. Man chooses his own seat, selects his own position. Guided by his will, he chooses sin. Or guided by divine grace, he chooses right. And yet in his choice, God sits as sovereign on the throne, not disturbing, but still overruling and proving himself to be able to deal as well with free creatures as with creatures without freedom, as well able to effect his purpose when he has endowed men with thought and reason and judgment as when he had only to deal with the solid rocks and with the embedded sea. O oh, Christians, you shall never be able to fathom this, but you may wonder at it. I know there is an easy way of getting out of this great deep, either by denying predestination altogether, or by denying free agency altogether. But if you can hold it too, if you can say, yes, my consciousness teaches me that man does as he wills, but my faith teaches me that God does as he wills, and these two are not contrary, the one to the other, and yet I cannot tell how it is. I cannot tell how God effects his end. I can only wonder and admire and say, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. Every creature free and doing as it wills, yet God, more free still and doing as he wills, not only in heaven, but among the inhabitants of this lower earth. 